All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the first day of uh, SharePoint Conference. I hope all your sessions have been exciting and going fantastic so far. Uh, my name is Quentin, and I'm a program manager on the SharePoint Enterprise Content Management team. And for the past few years, I've been working on eDiscovery, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So it's been a long journey for me and the rest of our team to finally get here, but we're really excited to show this to everybody. So it's pretty fantastic to be at such an awesome conference and just feel the energy from everybody and just hang out with the best SharePoint people around. I hope you guys are all having a lot of fun. So thanks for coming to the eDiscovery session where you're going to see how you can help save your organization money, help your legal team sleep better at night, and hopefully look like a hero while doing it. Does that sound good to everybody? Come. That was pretty weak. Let's try again. Who wants to look like a hero? All right. Let's get started. So I didn't want to set your guys' expectations too high or anything, but we've actually already gone out to a few conferences and been presenting this, uh, this content, you know, showing what's coming with eDiscovery. We actually went to the eDiscovery Leadership Institute Summit a few weeks ago to talk to a lot of the top people that their job titles are like eDiscovery Program Manager or Director of eDiscovery. And so these are the guys that, you know, there's a few people at each, you know, different company that really care about this stuff a lot. It's very important to them. eDiscovery is expensive. It's challenging. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of information to help you understand the problem. But when we've been going and talking to these people, they've been really jazzed up about what we've got coming in eDiscovery. And you're going to see why they're so excited about this stuff. So first, let's talk a little bit about what eDiscovery is. eDiscovery is the process of gathering and producing electronic content for legal cases. The average corporate civil case costs over $1 million just for eDiscovery. And you can get in big trouble and receive fines if you don't follow the proper eDiscovery process. So there's a lot at stake here. So the electronic discovery reference model kind of is, uh, gives an idea of what the eDiscovery process is. And I've kind of broken that down into four of the most important steps. So identify and preserve is the first. And that's all about identifying the people and sources of content that you care about for eDiscovery content that's going to be involved in the case, that you want to protect that content and make sure it doesn't get deleted, because you're going to need that as evidence for the case. Second is search and process. So that's all about reducing the relevant content that needs to be reviewed. You want to reduce your data to a small amount as possible, because review costs a lot of money. So once you've reduced that data to the relevant content set, you export that and then hand it off for legal review. So legal review is when you have attorneys go through and read page by page all of that content you're going to send off for court. And attorneys are not very cheap. They're kind of expensive. So you can imagine having them read through pages of documents. And we can be talking gigabytes of data here. That's going to cost a lot of money. So it's easy to see where you can really help your organization reduce costs. Then the last step is produce. And that's where you take that content once, it's been, once it has been re reviewed, and you produce that into a format that's acceptable by the court. So at the beginning of the process, you have a large volume of content. Often hundreds of gigabytes of data is what we hear from our customers. And then you reduce that content, and you work towards increasing the relevance. And so in the review stage, hopefully if you have a good process, you end up having those lawyers review a couple of gigabytes or a few gigabytes of data. And then by the time you go to court, they're actually presenting you know, tens or maybe a couple hundred pages of actual documents as evidence. E-discovery is hard, and the legal risk is scary. Is anyone here concerned about the content you have building up and how much it would cost to go through and analyze and review that content if you have a case? So a few people. Your legal team probably is. I work at Microsoft, and I talk to our legal team pretty frequently because they care a lot about these features. And that's top of mind for them all the time. Our data is growing and growing and growing. And over the years, 
Each year, it's been increasing significantly how much content we have to deal with, and these e-discovery costs just continue to grow and grow. So when we're talking to our customers, there were three major challenges that came up again and again. The first was around preservation. We heard from our customers that when a legal event begins, there is immediately a legal obligation to make sure that any related content is not modified or destroyed. So you need to protect that content. Content is spread across many different locations, including email systems, file shares, SharePoint sites, as well as user computers. SharePoint can be especially challenging because we have all these different types of content, web pages, social data, SharePoint lists. There's not really a great acceptable standard for or easy way to get that content out of SharePoint into an offline format that you could go send off to lawyers to go through and review. So that's a big concern we heard from our customers. The second was search and data reduction. With an average cost of $10,000 per gigabyte for legal review, the biggest e-discovery cost savings companies can realize is by reducing the data set they send off for legal review. It often takes weeks or months of manually collecting content and then using expensive e-discovery tools in order to search and do data reduction. And that also applies to that preservation step as well. Has anyone ever had their legal team come to them and say, hey, we need to get this content out of SharePoint or out of Exchange or off users' computers. We need to export that and put it into some re separate repository because we need to preserve and archive that content. All right. Do you guys enjoy getting those requests and interrupting the important work you're trying to do of keeping your infrastructure running? It's a real challenge. Now, this is SharePoint Conference, and a lot of the legal community is just starting to get their heads wrapped around SharePoint. And so when we go out and talk to our customers, the legal guys, they're like, we hear about this SharePoint thing. We're starting to deal with, a, with it a little bit, but it's just growing and growing and growing. And we're, as SharePoint community, we're going to just get these requests more and more over time. When we go and talk to the Exchange people, which email is about 80% of the content for electronic discovery, it's old hat for them. Those administrators get these requests all the time, and they're having to deal with it day by day. The third challenge was around export. Getting the content out of SharePoint and Exchange is just hard. It often requires a lot of manual effort by IT, as well as your legal team, to be able to get that content out. Also, you might be concerned about moving to the cloud. And a lot of legal teams say, we can't move to the cloud, because if our data is there, how do we get it back out for e-discovery? And so that's another major concern we heard. So let's go ahead and jump right in to a demo. And this is just going to be a quick, simple thing that kind of shows a little bit of what I've been talking about. Now, you guys, I hope you all went to the keynote. And probably a lot of you went to the ECM overview session. So this isn't going to be super new. They kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but that's OK. It's still pretty exciting. So this is the eDiscovery query page. And it's pretty cool that we can search across both Exchange and SharePoint content. Now, how about an applause for that? Come on. This was a lot of work. Uh, to just get this done. We're leveraging OAuth as well as just lots of improvements. And I'm going to go through and talk about some of that work that we've just done in the platform that's been able to enable this. But I'm here in a SharePoint site, and I'm actually able to go in and preview Exchange email, link instant messages, as well as a whole variety of basically all the content in Exchange, as well as SharePoint content all in one page. And we're going to dive much deeper here into how all this stuff works. You're going to learn a whole bunch of new cool things that you haven't seen yet. So that just shows a little bit of the power of what we can do. So the quick investigation shows our three advantages that we have. In place, real time, and more content. Today, even if you're using sophisticated e-discovery search technology, you probably spend weeks copying content out of SharePoint and Exchange, and then putting that into a separate e-discovery search system. So it often takes weeks or months to get answers. Well, why is this important? 
when you get involved in a lawsuit, you're often having to make decisions about, well, who's going to be involved with this case? How much content do we have? How much is it going to cost us to do this e-discovery process? Now, I talked before, a million dollars to do e-discovery for the average case. Well, if someone's suing you for a few hundred thousand dollars, and it's going to cost you more than that to do e-discovery, would you want to waste a bunch of money on lawyers trying to fight the case? Or would you want to just go ahead and settle? So there's a lot of important legal decisions that need to be made that have financial ramifications. And rather than making your legal team wait weeks or months, they can go to this e-discovery center, create a case site, and do a search and get that answer immediately. And that's just huge. In place is really what enables this. And so that first advantage, in place. We can preserve content in place. We're able to search across that content in place. And that just makes things a lot easier and simpler and less error prone. And then three more content. Since we're just working with this content in SharePoint and Exchange, we can natively handle those documents those different types of exchange data, link instant messages, SharePoint social data, we can natively handle that better than anyone else, and we can just handle a whole bunch of different types of content. When we were out talking to our customers, a lot of the top leading e-discovery tools couldn't even handle OneNote files. Does anyone here use OneNote files? OK. OneNote files are everywhere in SharePoint. They're hugely valuable, and yet a lot of the top e-discovery tools can't handle that content we're able to. So now you can analyze and make decisions anytime in seconds. So to make a decision whether to pursue a case or how to negotiate the terms of e-discovery, what you're going to search for, what keywords you're going to use, you can do that. You can get the information you need so you can make those critical decisions without having to wait a long period of time. So rather than having a process where you have to go to 100 different SharePoint sites and 20 different Exchange mailboxes, spend hours copying that content out, and then moving it into a separate system, you're just able to go to a SharePoint site, hit a couple buttons, and find out how much data is there, and get your questions answered. So there are a few key things that I want you to take away from this session. First, you're going to learn about the capabilities of eDiscovery across Office. So in place hold lets you preserve content in real time. You've probably already heard about that a bit, and we'll talk about how exactly that works and what that looks like. In place hold lets you preserve content in real time to protect important data for legal actions. The second is query. That helps you identify relevant content, and then export gets the relevant data out of the system so you can hand it off for legal review. Then we have those three advantages I talked about. In place helps you reduce your risk, makes things faster, easier. You get higher fidelity preservation of that content because we're just handling it natively in Exchange and SharePoint. And we're helping you use less storage space. You're not having to create this separate archive and copy all the content out, and well, as well as go back and copy content again over time, helping you save money. Then that second advantage, real time, faster searching, get answers immediately, the content's up to date. So when you're doing your searches, you're able to get up-to-date data because we're just leveraging the SharePoint and Exchange search system. And then three more content. So preserving, searching, and export of OneNote, web pages, communities, microblogs, link instant messages. We just handle all that content for you and much more. Third, these capabilities and advantages in the, the interface that we've built, we've helped make e-discovery simpler and a lot easier, which helps you save time and money, helps you reduce risks so you can protect your organization, and that's how we're going to help, make, help make you look like a hero. E-discovery is complicated, but to make it easier and solve the three challenges I just covered, we made it as easy as one, two, three. One, in place hold protects the content in real time. Two, query helps you analyze and make decisions to reduce to the relevant content you care about. And three, export. With a few clicks, you can get the data out of the system so you can use it in other e-discovery tools or send it off for legal review. 
And of course, this works across SharePoint Exchange and Link and file shares. So whether you're on premises or Office 365, we have the tools you need to help with e-discovery. So that's probably enough talking for now. We're going to go ahead and switch over to going more in depth on what this looks like. So this is the eDiscovery case homepage. And so we have the eDiscovery Center site collection, which is kind of your portal into creating eDiscovery case sites. And then to manage the eDiscovery process, we've created this eDiscovery case site. And it's just a SharePoint site, so you could share this with other members of your legal team so you can work together as well as manage permissions on it. But we've built some specific eDiscovery capabilities in here. So the first are eDiscovery sets. And this is the grouping mechanism you can use to identify exchange mailboxes, SharePoint sites, file shares, and manage that content, whether that content is on hold. And so that's kind of the first step in the process, identifying what content you're working with and then putting that under preservation. The second step of the process is search and export. So once you've identified the content that you want to work with, you're able to search and reduce that data set. So since we're just getting started, we're going to go ahead and create a new eDiscovery set and select some Exchange mailboxes and a SharePoint site uh, to work with. So the eDiscovery sets uh, allow you to basically select the content that you want on hold. And when you're doing eDiscovery, there's often this process up front where you, you do interviews, you talk to people who are potentially involved with the case, you find out uh, who has content, who worked on this particular thing, who's, you know, who's related to this activity. So we designed the experience around helping you scope down to the specific locations of content that you care about. Now we're using improvements in SharePoint and Exchange using OAuth so that Exchange knows that I'm logged in as Belinda and she has access as an eDiscovery administrator on the Exchange side. So she's allowed to work with these mailboxes for eDiscovery. I can also access SharePoint sites. Now one of the key pieces of feedback we heard from our customers was that early in the eDiscovery process, you often don't know, uh, you don't know search terms, uh, but you do know the locations of content usually. And so we set the scope as really the SharePoint site because you want to cast your net kind of broadly because you don't know exactly what documents you're going to be able to put on hold or what's going to be important for the case down the road. The process can actually often take uh, months or years before you actually come back and start searching across that content. So, you can also add file shares in here. This is in Office 365, so I'm not able to do that here. But in that last interface I showed, you can just do that. So we also have this filter section. And so you'll notice here, we can see what our in-place hold status is. We get an idea of how much content is here. The items as well as the size are both important. So I can start making some ideas. Is this the right content I want to have on hold? Uh, you know, is, is there too much content here? And maybe we should try and go back and talk to people and narrow down that scope. And we can also do queries. And so I'm working on a particular uh, case involving wingtip. And so we know we only need content related to wingtip, so I can enter that in a filter, as a filter. Hit apply. And that's going to help me reduce down the set of content that I'm working with, the content that I'm going to keep on hold. And that's going to apply both across Exchange and SharePoint. Now, we also have a couple of other sections here. So I can enter in a date range, uh, as well as an author sender. And domains are also really important for exchange. So let's say I only want to look at uh, content um, from the wingtip.com domain, you know, email related to that domain. I could enter that in as a filter that we work with here. I can also preview the results to make sure that that's the content that I want to work with. And so I can preview the exchange and SharePoint items here. 
And this looks like the right set of data that we want to keep on hold. So we're going to continue working with this case for a little while, so we want to make sure none of it goes away. We go ahead and enable in place hold and hit save. Now what happens behind the scenes is we go to Exchange, we go to that SharePoint site, and we say, hey, this thing's on hold. But we don't need to go and copy all of the content and archive it away. Since we're in place, we can just be smart about when content changes, then we keep that item around. So this is our sales and marketing site, and here's a wiki page on it. And let's pretend I'm some other user, and I'm just trying to get my work done. I can come in here and edit this page. And the cool thing about hold is users don't need to know that their SharePoint site or their mailbox is on hold. We're able to just preserve that content behind the scenes. And we actually have this special uh, location within the Exchange mailbox. And so as a user is editing or deleting their content, we put that in this special folder in their mailbox behind the scenes. And so we make sure that content is there. Now, the, the user does not see that, but the e-discovery person, the compliance officer that's using our e-discovery center, they still have access to search across the current content as well as what's been deleted and is still on hold. And the same thing happens in SharePoint. Since I'm logged in as Belinda, the compliance officer, I have access to this preservation hold library. And so that wiki page I just edited, that's where it went. And so that was a web page, and we actually saved that as an MHT file, which is an archived web page. It saves the styling, the images, all of the content along with that. So you can see I made a change to the page, but we still have what it looked like at that original point in time. And so when I'm going and doing my searches, I'm able to search across that content that's in that preservation hold library. What do you guys think? All right. So we've kind of completed our hold step of the process. We've got our content on hold. Now we know that we want to start doing some searching. So I'm going to go ahead, create a new query. And what you'll notice is that the set of content that we have here is not that you know, 1,000 items I had when I first created my e-discovery set and selected these sources. What we're doing is applying that search criteria we set with the e-discovery set applies to the searches that you're running. So I don't have to start all over and doing all that work again. If I go back and modify my hold, uh, change what sources are there, or change my search queries, that's going to just apply to the queries that I'm working on. Now, I've got uh, some uh, search query here. So we're, we've got proximity search, which is an improvement that we've done just in the, the platform as a whole. So proximity search was something we heard was very critical to our e-discovery customers. So you can just do this in the search platform today. But what this does is it's going to search the wingtip keyword where it's within 30 keywords of market with a wildcard or campaign. And so I can go ahead, run that search query, and that's going to help me scope down and reduce the content that I'm working with, helping me save money. So you'll see that I've reduced down the content a little bit. So the first thing I want to highlight is the sources web part. So I've already talked about this a little bit. We're breaking down and showing the different sources. So these three exchange mailboxes and this SharePoint site, uh, the statistics for each individual one. And so this is part of our focus in this experience on statistics. Now, I don't have a whole ton of content here, but we've done a whole bunch of scale testing uh, with uh, thousands of items and enormous search indexes. But creating all that data for a demo is a little bit of a challenge, because we don't want to show all of the confidential Microsoft email we've got going on. But uh, I can see how much content is here, and that helps me make decisions. If there's a lot of data for one particular user, maybe they're highly relevant for the case, or maybe our search criteria is not very effective and we need to go do some more investigation. The total is also very critical here, because you know, I can look at that and say, well, if there's 10 gigabytes, that's going to cost me $100,000 to go and do document review. 
Maybe I want to go back to the opposition and say, hey, we need to adjust the search criteria. We're just getting back too much data. You guys aren't going to want to review that because the opposition has to review it as well. So helping you make decisions. The other is this query statistics web part. So this is breaking down the query into different components. So you can see, if I were to change the query, uh, just focus on these particular pieces, that's how much content I'm going to get back. This is also really useful for just helping you fine tune and adjust your query. Now when we go and talk to legal teams, they're often working with hundreds or even a thousand different you know, pieces of a query. And for a long period of time, they spend a lot of work fine tuning. We've seen uh, you know, single queries that were just pages in a Word document, just enormous. And they're working and fine tuning that and just making all these different adjustments. So that's why we've really focused the experience on helping the legal team get their job done and meet their needs. Because when you have that much content, you're not going to go through and review each item uh, individually. The other thing I want to highlight is just the results section. So I've already gone through and shown the different results. There's a few other cool things that we can do here. So one is, you know, this is an uh, email that has an attachment in it. I can actually click on those links, and we're going to open up Outlook Web Access. What do you guys think of that? I can actually go in and preview this email. And so this is read only. It's basically your compliance person view for e-discovery. I can't reply to this or do anything with it, but I'm getting the native view of what this content looks like. And that's really huge for investigation. I can see exactly what it looks like. So I can go through, I can spot check, I can sample and make sure this is the right result set we want to return. Very useful for doing investigations. I can also preview link instant messages. So here's a conversation that uh, Garth had with Bonnie. Now, I haven't talked about it too much yet, but the link instant message content as well as meetings or attachments in meetings, we actually archive that content into the Exchange user's mailbox. And that's a setting you can enforce as an IT administrator is basically all, all of that user's content be archived into Exchange. And that way, you have it for your discovery as well as it can just be useful for them to have in their Outlook as well, uh, that they can go back and look at that past context. But especially useful for e-discovery, and that's how we're able to handle that link content. Now, we also want to make sure that we help reduce and scope down content. So we've provided a few more tools to help you do that. One is I can see that uh, Garth has uh, you know, a good amount of content here. So, Maybe we want to just look at what is the content that Garth has been involved in. So we have this property uh, restriction that we can apply here. So I guess enter in Garth's name, hit apply, and that's going to reduce down that result set and help me, help me get to the more relevant data. And so that'll run the search again. You'll notice we have less results here now. Now I can flip over to the SharePoint tab. We've got Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, social data. And what if I want to reduce that down? We have these multi-select refiners. So if I want to just look at web pages or Word documents, I can just select those, hit apply. So more tools helping you reduce that content. And when you're dealing with you know, a million items, 100 gigabytes of data, this is just huge for helping you get down to that couple of gigabytes that you actually really care about, saving you thousands and thousands of dollars in that review phase. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about working with a large amount of queries. Well, I've actually created a few queries here in Excel. And let's say I want to see how uh, changes in my proximity search affects things. Well, I can go back, go to my queries list, kick this into edit mode, and now I can do quick editing. So if I wanted to go back and quickly change the keywords here, I could do that. I'm going to go ahead and paste this in. And so this is going to create those three queries for me. And this makes it a lot easier to just to try testing things out in Excel or just making quick edits here, trying some quick changes. And then I can select these. And we have a few eDiscovery specific commands here in the ribbon. So I can go ahead and update statistics. And so this is going to run each of those search queries, get me back the items and size. And then if I want to open those up, I can do some more work with those. 
We also have this copy query command. So that lets me, if I've already done a whole bunch of work on a particular query, I could copy that and create a new one to start working on so I still have that old one. So you'll notice we can see, yeah, you know, changing the proximity that has some effect here. So I could go sample this and see, you know, are we losing relevant content or could we use this as a method to scope down and say, hey, we're gonna get all the relevant content if we search within five instead of within 30. So that's pretty cool so far. But what about, we have all this content, it's still in Exchange and SharePoint, and that's a problem. Well, we've made it really easy to just go ahead and get that content out of the system. So I can select from a few of these queries, hit this export button, and I can also do an export right from that query page. So if I'm just working with one query, I can hit export, and I can come in here, and there's a few settings I wanna highlight. So one is, you know, we've talked a lot about data reduction and how that helps you save money. Well, I've got a few mailboxes in here. Those three people all work on the same team. They probably have a lot of mail content that is interrelated. There's probably one mail, mail message and it's in all of their mailboxes. Well, we can remove the duplicate exchange content and really significantly reduce how much data we have to export out of exchange, once again, helping you save money. We can also include versions for SharePoint. And so you could do an export of an entire SharePoint site and include the versions for that if you wanna go and look through all that version data. Or if you just wanna get versions for this particular search query, you can do that. And sometimes you have content such as password protected zip files or emails with pretty good privacy that are encrypted. Now, SharePoint, or uh, Microsoft uh, RMS technologies and encryption for email, SharePoint, we're able to index that and search across that content. But there's other types of things that our search indexer has a little trouble with. So we're actually able to include that content in the export that applies to that, these three mailboxes and that SharePoint site. And that way the legal team could go and analyze that content and use special tools to work with that. So this is all looking good so far. We wanna go ahead and kick this off. There's two options that I get once this export is ready. I can download uh, just the results. So it's gonna go and download those, those Exchange mailboxes, uh, that SharePoint content, uh, or I can download uh, just a report. So if I, want, if I don't wanna download all of that content, uh, so this is just gonna sign into Office 365 here for us, and then we're pretty much ready to go. Uh, we can download a report, and that's gonna give us basically a spreadsheet that has a full list of all of the items in that search query, so you could go through and check that um, before you go and go ahead and download the entire thing. So this is our eDiscovery Download Manager, and it's actually a client-side tool, and that's what allows us to be able to do an export and download both from Exchange and SharePoint whether it's on premises or in the cloud. And so what we're doing right now is we're calling into Exchange Online and we're saying, hey, here's our search query and these are the mailboxes we're working with. And it's gonna download those mailboxes directly to the user's desktop. So anywhere I could download to if I have a file share or an attached drive or just to my desktop, I can download that content straight away. Or in the SharePoint content, we're just gonna download all of those native files uh, the web pages we'll get as .mhts, so they're archived, I can take them offline. I actually have an export that's already uh, completed. So we can go in and take a look at that. So here are uh, the mailboxes that I was working with. Uh, the sales and marketing team site. And so you can see we've got some web pages here, uh, some documents that we've downloaded. So all the office documents and PDFs, we just download that in the native format. Uh, here's that web page from the Preservation Hold Library. If I want to go ahead and open that up, so here's that page that we looked at earlier. So the key thing here is that we're downloading, so this is the current, current item there, right? And it has that text that I entered in uh, earlier. And we get SharePoint lists, uh, communities, and uh, social data as .csv files. And so everything's in an offline portable format. 
you can hand that off for legal review. I also want to point out that we include the electronic discovery reference model XML manifest. And that's kind of a mouthful, but it's an industry standard for e-discovery tool data interchange. And it's basically just an XML file, and it has a bunch of metadata about each item, where it was originally located in the system, as well as additional metadata properties. Uh, and then it says where those uh, items are in the export. So you could take this and import it. There's tons of e-discovery specific tools out there from all sorts of different vendors. Uh, there's one specific for search and one specific for review. And so you're able to just take this data set and any of those tools that support the EDRM standard, you can import this into and, con and continue working with it. So that was really important. So, switch back here. So, we saw the three steps of how we're making e-discovery as easy as one, two, three. Now, as I was going through that demo, you'll notice I didn't run any PowerShell commands. I didn't use any crazy tools. I didn't go to various different sites and pull all that content out. We've made this really easy for your legal team to be able to go in and do this work themselves. We really focused a lot on making an easy to use experience focused on exactly what those legal teams we needed. We've done a whole bunch of studies and work uh, with a lot of different legal people to make sure this tool works for their needs and they're able to handle all the steps of the process that we need, that, that they need to get their jobs done. So making e-discovery as easy as one, two, three. So one, in place hold. So protecting that content in place in real time. Query, being able to search, do data reduction, reduce that result set, helping you save money. And three, once you've identified the relevant content you care about, getting that content out of the system. And of course, being able to do that with SharePoint Exchange and Link. So then to review the three advantages we talked about. So in place, helping you save money, reduce your cost. The in place approach helps you save storage space because you don't need to take a copy of everything. You can just smartly preserve content when you need to and then you're able to just search across that content in place. And we've brought the same search technology from SharePoint and put that into Exchange for Outlook web access searches. And that's just huge because that's what has enabled us to build this e-discovery feature set. It's improved, of course, the user experience for searches in Exchange, but that makes it very powerful because now we have leading search technology both in SharePoint Exchange that we can work with to do these types of scenarios, be able to do e-discovery. And of course, that system is always indexing. So when you go and run searches, you're able to search on real-time, up-to-date content. And the third advantage, just handling more types of content natively, OneNote files, exchange contacts and tasks, uh, link instant messages and meetings, SharePoint social data, So we, you saw the three capabilities, in place, hold, query, and export, as well as the advantages, in place, real time, and more content. And all of this comes together to just help simplify and make e-discovery easier, helping you save time, save money, as well as reduce risk. So uh, that's it. Uh, really appreciate your time. I'm gonna turn it open to Q&A right now. Uh, and of course, if anyone has anything they'd like to see or dive more in depth into, happy to jump back into showing some stuff that we didn't handle in the demo. Um, I think we've got microphones on the sides too, so it'd be good to use. Um, what about the merge? How does that handle? How do you handle merge? Um, could you explain a little more about handling versioning? We've heard feedback both ways. So the, the question's around handling versions of documents for e-discovery, and what, what exactly are legal teams looking for, and how does our system handle that? Um, the, you know, the, 
we've heard from different customers that they want to be able to have some control around that. There's cases where they don't need to get all the versions. That's just adding a whole bunch of, of uh, extra, extra documents. But there definitely are a lot of cases where customers want to be able to get the documents out of the system. So uh, there's a variety of reasons why we didn't want to just index all of those versions in place. Because that it turns out that really reduces relevancy and would add a bunch of stuff that users are searching on. So with the export, we allow you to get the versions for documents out of the system. So you could do an export of an entire SharePoint site. And then you could put that all into a file share and search across that and work with that content. Or if you just care about making sure you get versions for the search query you already run, uh, you know, there might be cases where you're not too worried if there's documents that you know, a previous version might have matched. Because you you're not too worried about that for your policies or whatever, whatever reasons. So. All right, over here first. Uh, my question is about um, if you're trying to discover content that still resides in SharePoint 2010, I'm wondering um, which of the features um, don't apply anymore. So, so for instance, I would just expect in place holds don't apply, but maybe could you still do the old um, regular holds that you had in 2010? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, I, and I'm curious about exporting and exporting versions as yep. well. Yeah. Um, so to give a rundown of that, uh, so to use these new capabilities, you need to be on Exchange 2013, as, and you'll need your search infrastructure to be on Search 2013. As long as you have, have that, uh, if you have your SharePoint 2013 search is indexing SharePoint 2010 or even SharePoint 2007 sites, uh, we can search across that. You can validate it as content. You're not going to be able to put it on in place hold, the new SharePoint 2010 style hold, but you can search on it and you can export that content out of the system. Uh, now, uh, the, there's also the SharePoint 2010 hold, which is an individual item hold. This feature set doesn't, the 2013 in place hold does not integrate with that, that previous feature at all. So we're not going to go turn that on or anything. One of, the, one of the key things we learned from going out and talking to our, our customers was that legal did not want to get in the way of users. And it was very key to us to make sure the hold process was just transparent, that users didn't need to know they were on hold, and we didn't prevent them from editing or deleting their documents. And that was one of the big pieces of feedback we heard from legal teams was in SharePoint 2010 was, we just we can't really use the feature except for in sites that aren't really in use anymore because we don't want to stop people from editing and working on their documents. Those users are going to come back and complain to the legal team and we'll have to turn the hold off. So that's why it was really key to us to handle this all behind the scenes transparently. All right, over here. First, uh, good job. You guys are heading the right direction. Thank you. Uh, how are you guys handling list attachments? You know, I kind of saw you said lists are handled in the CSV. How do the attachments and the relations of those attachments stored in the export? And then the same thing kind of applies to InfoPath and its embedded attachments. That's a great question. Um, I should maybe give you a card. I could follow up on that a little bit more in depth later. Um, the, so exchange attachments, we can search across. We handle all those in export. Uh, the SharePoint list attachments, um, there's, we, those aren't indexed by search, and so we're not able to search across those. And I don't believe we handle those for export either. There's a little bit more detail there that, that we could discuss more in depth, but that would be something to take a little more offline. Okay. All right, over here. Uh, yes, actually, the, the previous question that was uh, asked from this microphone covered much of what I was interested in. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I did want to be clear now that in order to be able to do what you demonstrated today, really we would be looking at an Exchange 2013 and SharePoint 2013 environment. And uh, can this work entirely on premises if you're using no 365 presence? So if you're, using three, if you're not using 365 at all or if, you're, or if you're using 365 for one particular piece? Um, I guess I don't understand the question you're asking me. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so you have SharePoint and Exchange on premises. That's correct. Right? And, yeah, the, the, and, and only on premises. Yeah, yeah that's, that's just fine. So that the features are, sets are going to work there just fine. You just need your SharePoint search farm 
to be upgraded to 2013. Okay. Right on premises, and you'll need uh, if you want. So you can use the eDiscovery features without being connected to Exchange mm -hmm. at all. But if you have Exchange and you want to connect to that and work with that, then you'll you'll want ex Exchange will need to be upgraded to 2013 because the whole search platform and everything is is totally changed, and we need all that to be able to work with that. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and then uh, just one curiosity. Um, if you have marked documents for hold that are in place, if a user uh, attempts to delete the document, what's the user experience? So with, with the 2013 in place hold, the user doesn't see anything. If they go and delete a document, to them it looks exactly like it was deleted. Okay. And if, uh, for example, if, if uh, retention runs and goes through, we actually allow retention to just go through and run and clean up items. So all the, thing, you know, all the typical things that are going on in the site that users expect, that's just going to happen. But we make sure that behind the scenes, we're capturing and we're keeping that, that content. Okay, thank you. Uh, over here. Uh, just a quick question on um, the metadata associated with documents. Mm -hmm. When inside, let's say, a SharePoint site and you've got some metadata associated with that, does that get brought down? That's a great question. So. The metadata on the most of your documents, so your office file formats, we have the, the metadata actually gets embedded in the document, so that's actually available. And so when we do the export or when we do preservation, we actually keep all that metadata. And so when we do the export, it's embedded in the document. Uh, we also uh, will use the client-side object model. So we're using web services to call in and get metadata as well. And so for some documents, we don't have uh, metadata. For example, like if you have a text file or uh, you know, different, different formats don't have the, that embedded metadata, we'll call into SharePoint and we'll, we'll get that metadata as well. But I'm more talking about metadata of the document as columns. Yeah, yeah, so the, the column metadata gets embedded into Word documents and PowerPoint documents. It's actually, like if you take that whole so document like the dip, I guess the dip panel information yes. gets so, tossed so, into the header of the Word? Yeah, so okay. that all stays in the document when we, when we export it. Okay. And those properties, uh, you know, that metadata gets indexed by search as well. And so when yep. you're searching, that's, that stuff yep. will, will apply too. Uh, if you uh, set managed properties in search, then right. you could do specific yep. searches on those specific properties as well. And then a final thought on uh, external systems that aren't SharePoint Exchange and file shares. Is that just a, a no-go or some company, some partner would just kind of write something that is a bolt-on to this e-discovery? That's, that's a good question as well. So we don't have any support you. for additional, uh, sure. you know, you could imagine we might go and support, you know, like right. we have an out-of-box connector for yeah. Documentum. We don't support that right now, as I know the eDiscover source, okay. but love to hear feedback about how important, how important that is, you okay. know, something right. to consider Thank in the future. You. All right, over here. Yeah, my question's about versions. You haven't really mentioned enterprise versus standard, but my understanding was these features are for enterprise exchange and enterprise SharePoint. We've actually, we've got our marketing guy here. I don't know if I can speak to that one. Do you? Do we... the, the key question for me anyway, so this is where, this is what I want to know is whether, well, Good to know it's complicated. Yeah, come, is come whether up, come it's up after. Yeah. So my question really, you may be able to answer this one, is whether if you have an enterprise environment, which I believe this is part of, um, mm -hmm. and you create a, a site for doing the, what you were demonstrating, are you able to search uh, standard sites? And therefore, really, you're only having to license your legal staff for the purposes of doing the e-discovery, but everybody else can carry on using standard. Uh, I don't know on that. Yeah, come, come up to us and, and uh, we, we, there's some again. other people here who can help, help answer questions, so come up afterward. As well as anybody who, who, who uh, you know, if you've got questions, I'll, there'll be a few of us here around. We've actually got some people from the exchange team. We do have Julian and Anker here from the exchange side who have been really key in helping us build all this. Obviously, we couldn't have done it without a ton of work uh, from the exchange side as well. And I also want to mention there is a hands-on lab that you guys can check out. and. We'll be, I'll be at the ECM table at Ask the Experts. So you can find me there, there too. So I want to point that out. So yeah, 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about, little bit about uh, performance and scalability? How yeah. many objects you can fit in a search server? How many search servers in a farm? That sort of thing? Um, so I can talk about the e-discovery specific limits. You'll, and I can kind of talk a little bit about how that, what kind of impact that has. So I'll talk about that a little bit. For you know, stuff on sizing, search, yeah. and everything, you'll want to hit one of the, the search sessions for that. Uh, so basically, uh, we support searching 1,500 uh, exchange mailboxes and 100 SharePoint sites in one search query. You are able to create multiple search queries, of course. Uh, and you know, we, we've done performance testing with, with large amount of items. Really the key thing affecting uh, the user experience of how long it takes to run a search is how many sources you have in there. And actually if you're you know, working with 10 uh, SharePoint sites and you know, 10 to 20 exchange mailboxes, which is by far the common case, those searches are just as fast, actually probably even a little faster than what I was showing because the internet here is being a little slow. Um, so we, we really intended for the common case of e-discovery that the, the user searches that you're running are, are fairly quick and interactive. We've heard a lot of feedback from our customers that a lot of the tools they use today, they're running searches that takes, take minutes or even hours to go do. So um, we've gotten some kudos on that. So, uh, and we've done validation with searching on very large indexes. Just the impact in general, we expect that we're just leveraging the enterprise search system that your SharePoint users are using as well as the search system that's in Exchange. And so we're not making a huge hit to the performance of that. Really it's just you know, a minor little bit of extra work because you have you know, a couple of people or one person in your organization that's doing e-discovery search queries once in a while. So we don't expect you needing to add a whole bunch of extra e-discovery you know, servers just for e-discovery in particular. All right, over here. A couple of questions. Uh, you showed the, the search and then in place hold um, in the new e-discovery screen. Is there a way to selectively uh, place the documents on hold uh, for the searches that are returned? Um, or is it just like only place everything that is on hold or you don't place anything that is on hold? Yeah, so uh, the, the SharePoint 2013 in place hold, you're putting that entire s scope, so that mailbox or that SharePoint site on hold. Uh, the filter criteria that you put in there basically will go back and will say, hey, this thing doesn't need to be on hold, so we don't need to keep it in the preservation hold library. We don't have a, you know, select this item and that item to have on hold, although in, in SharePoint we did have that feature for SharePoint 2010, which can make some sense in, you know, like a, an archive record center type of scenario, but for uh, when we were out talking to legal teams, they didn't know what individual items they could go put on hold. If they did, they would probably just grab a copy of them. Well, I guess uh, specifically I was looking for, uh, and, and we talked to legal, holds, uh, legal people, and one of the things that they came back was in the preview search results screen that you actually demoed um, just a while back, yeah. uh, they see the list of results based on the query that they put in. That's all great. They see the results out. Now they're, you know, off the 25 results that they see, can I just put 20 on hold? because yeah. I know that those 20 are the ones that are relevant to my investigation, and the remaining five are just useless. Yeah, so yeah. The, the in place hold is really intended for a, a large scope. We don't know exactly what we're looking for okay. yet. Uh, I'd recommend an export for that scenario, and that, that way they know they have it in some, other, you know, in some other, other place. You could do that as well as just say, okay, I want these documents, I'm just gonna export this okay. set. You know? we, that's, that's one of the, even if, you know, there's a lot of flexibility here in the, the different things that you can do. And so, um, at a minimum, we've made it a lot easier to get the content out of the system, right? So, if, uh, if you have specific reasons why uh, in-place hold might not work perfectly for you, and you have some concerns about that, I'd love to chat about it one-on-one -on -one and kind of hear more feedback and, and what exactly the, the scenario is and what you want to accomplish. But at a minimum, you can use export to get the content out of the system. And that's really key is that that's, until now that's been a big huge challenge. And just that export is really simple and really easy to get that content out of the, out of the system. Okay, so. And can you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, reporting and uh, reporting capabilities uh, related to e-discovery that may yeah. be there in the new version? Uh, because one of the problems that have been there in 2010 and prior is, you know, you can place things on hold, you can do in place and you can do all those things. 
But if you come back and if you if somebody says, you know, can you just tell me what are the things that are in place? There was really no easy way to basically find that. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any out of the box functionality that is built into the 2013? We, we have a couple things. Um, so we can track. Uh, we're basically using the SharePoint auditing feature to track when content gets put on hold and what filter uh, applies to that. And so you can kind of keep track of the holds that you've been doing in that audit log, you know, what time that occurred and what time they were released. So that's, that's important information to keep track of. Uh, and then, then the other key thing is in export, we have this report that has a whole bunch of information about uh, you know, when the export was run, uh, what, what query was used, and so you have all the information and history on that as well. Those, those are really the two things that we have. Okay. Uh, the last question that I have is, uh, is there any implication on remote blob storage? If RBS is used, um, does the new functionality or the, the in-place mechanism, you know, are there any considerations to keep in mind? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. So understand. If, if the RBS is used to uh, oh. archive documents or to uh, keep records, um, does the new functionality of doing the hold, uh, the in-place hold and the search, does it, are there any special considerations over there or is it just going to be seamless? It, it should just be seamless. I'm not okay. aware of any special considerations. Okay, considerations right, there. <laughs> All right, over here. I was just wondering if there's any uh, limitations for like geo-distributed environments where you have a centralized search farm or a hybrid Office 365 and on-premises scenario, if there's any limitations for the features? Yeah, the, the, the key limitations are, is, is around hybrid. And so uh, if you have SharePoint on-premises as well as SharePoint online, you will need two separate eDiscovery Center site collections where you're doing, so you'll have to do two separate searches, two separate exports. Uh, and, and then there's also, you know, you throw Exchange into the mix. If you have SharePoint on-premises and you have Exchange on-premises and Exchange online, we're able to run a search and get the Exchange on-premises and online content. So if you're in Exchange hybrid configuration, you can use SharePoint on-premises to access that content. Now, as far as geo-distributed, uh, we're, we're leveraging the search infrastructure. So whatever uh, your central search system, what, whatever your search system is that you have your eDiscovery Center connected to, you're gonna be able to search that content and we'll download that content, you know, and just export that. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how you handle that. If you have, say, for example, I, I've heard of organizations where, you know, they might have a separate search system in a different location, and then they have one for the United States, and that's kind of split up. That you would have to have separate e-discovery centers for. You'd have to do separate e-discovery search queries for each of those different search systems. Now, a lot of the time, most of the cases um, you know, that we've heard from customers uh, you're dealing with projects where a lot of the people, like the site, like the content that's relevant for the case, it's usually spread in a few SharePoint locations that are in the same region. Now that's not always the case, but a lot of the time you'll only need to, if you do have geo-distributed search systems and they're not connected to each other, a lot of the time you probably won't need to run separate searches in all those search systems. You'll identify that, hey, the SharePoint sites we care about they're only in the United States. Okay, so the limitations primarily around the search center, I mean the search service itself and what, yes. it in, and what it's indexing. Yeah. So, so in a case of like a dedicated Office 365 environment instead of multi-tenant, if you were running a single search and, index, and, we're, and we're indexing that data, you would not necessarily need two searches or two e-discovery uh, centers? So then? you've got on-prem and dedicated that's connected together in hybrid. Yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're gonna need two separate e-discovery centers for that. I could be wrong on that, but I believe that's, even if you, that's something we could chat more about too and, and check into, because I don't know exactly offhand. Okay. And one final follow-up question is, if you're using uh, Office, tw I'm sorry, SharePoint 2013 and the 2010 compatibility mode, like we saw this morning's keynote, I assume that you don't, you know, you basically, those sites would be treated like a 2010 site. That's, that's the second time I've heard that question uh, today. <laughs> I don't know for sure. The, the in-place hold might actually work, but I don't know for certain. I gotta check back with a couple of the guys on, on our engineering team. So if, if you do want a definitive answer on that without trying it out yourself, you can come up and, and leave your card and okay. I can get back in touch with you. Great, thanks. 
All right. Hi, just wondering in this model, is there still a role for the um, archive repository like the 2010 Record Center had? Uh, so the Record Center is probably getting indexed by search, right? So you'll still be able to search across and, and work with that. If, you're, if you've got terabytes of content there, you probably don't want to put on the broad in-place hold there. Now, we, we did think about that scenario, but you probably just want to select, like, if you've got a particular case and you know you have content in a very large record center, I would suggest just going out and, cause since that location is usually pretty well organized, you can find what you're looking for. Either use the 2010 in-place hold feature to lock that content down, or pull it out of the system and put it in you know, a file share that you're using for that particular case or something along those lines. But the, the feature does work there. It's just if you've got, you know, 100 cases every year and a lot of them are involving your record center, your record center is always going to be on hold and nothing ever gets deleted from there, right? So that, that's kind of the, the main concern in that scenario. All right, over here. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, site collection deletion or mailbox deletion, how that would... So, it, yeah, if it's on hold, uh, we prevent you from doing that. Even site collection administrators can't delete their, their sites in, in SharePoint. Okay. All right. Hi. I was wondering about just the, like, extension and API support that you, you would have for kind of extending the e-discovery site or, like, say, adding a workflow to notify custodians that there's a matter and then based on the responses automatically kick off, yeah. you know, e-discovery sets or, or different queries. Mm -hmm. So the, the queries and e-discovery sets, they're just SharePoint list items. You can set most of the properties on the list items. There are, there is some e-discovery specific stuff that we uh, specifically did not enable um, for the client side object model, but it is available for on-premises uh, full trust solutions. Um, but so you can go in, you can read, uh, you can read that data, you can you can change data. But there are some limitations around it. We don't have a uh, a perfect extensibility story. But there's there's quite a lot of different things you should do. And uh, at Microsoft, we're actually working on a project right now to basically do that. Is uh, when basically go through and look at it's basically a notification system. Send out emails once a quarter telling people, hey here's all the cases you're involved with, and sending them a notification saying, hey, you're involved with all these cases, and here's the description of those cases. Make sure that uh, you're, you're not destroying any, because paper content, like if you have paper and folders or on your desk or whatever that could be related, that, that can be important to the case as well. And so at Microsoft, we want to send out notifications and let people know. And so that's actually something that we're working on doing and integrating in with the eDiscovery Center site collection. Thanks. Over here. Yeah, um, one question I was thinking about. Um, is it possible to like run search queries against some kind of a web analytics um, content or source? Uh, meaning I want to kind of do um, a replay or have an history of what has been done on the server, but that kind of user, can I extend this um, uh, e-discovery sites and also search against the, the web analytics? Probably what you would do there uh, would be creating just a new search page entirely, and you might reuse some of what we have. You might reuse some of the eDiscovery case, case site items. Um, it, it depends on how far you want to go there. The, the query page I showed uh, is fairly locked down, so you would create a new page entirely and, and create new components um, largely, but that's that's definitely an interesting scenario. We could, we could chat more about it, too. Okay, out of the box, I can't search against the web analytics. Like no. The user has been accessing the server that day. I have like 10 web front ends, and I need to aggregate the, the search and the logs results. So, um, some of the data from the, sh the SharePoint web analytics system is included. So, like, you can see like how, how often an item was viewed and stuff, but there are some limitations. At the farm Around level, that. I can do that? Um, so we know like how many views an item has, um, but really it's pretty pretty basic. And we, um, like, are you talking about 
having a separate web, web analytics system or getting data from the SharePoint web analytics system? Getting data from the SharePoint web analytics okay. data. It's, it's there already. So. It, it is there. It's, it's not on the items, though. So that's something I'd have to look a little bit more, more into. I don't, I don't know all the details on that. Okay. Um, if, if you want to learn more about it, come, come and talk to me and I could get your card or give you mine and we can talk about it more in the future. Okay, thanks. Uh, over here? Yeah, the follow-up question, you mentioned earlier that a site collection administrator can't delete a site yeah. when it's on hold. Yeah. My understanding in 2010 was that's when the hold feature is turned on. So if you decide, because you're a site collection admin, you can turn the feature off, and then when the feature's yeah. off, then you can delete the site. Yeah. So as such, you can. You just have to do it in two now, steps. We, we do a pretty good job of, of uh, preventing you from being able to um, get out of an in-place hold. It's, um, you, you just I'm switch pretty, the feature I, off. You, it's just a site collection feature. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that problem in 2010. Yeah. I'm 99% certain that we solved that in 2013. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was really key for okay. us to, to so solve. So you think that is fixed? I'm pretty certain, yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> obviously legally, yep. but you're bound uh, to put a hold on hold, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I, rem I remember that little little yeah. hole from 2010. Okay. Can you explain this question? Yeah. Um, so he, he was just asking whether, like, is this a site collection feature that the site collection admin could go and turn off and then delete the site collection? No, no, we, we prevent that from happening. It's um, pretty much. You have to do database level stuff as the only, like we went and tested, there's, there's a few different cases that you could do and we made sure we put in things to be able to prevent that from happening. So really you gotta be a database guy going in and actually mucking with the database in order to be able to do that kind of thing. All right, any other questions? Great, well enjoy the rest of your conference, thanks for coming.